Here I am again making a random impromptu video. I probably have about, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 minutes to make this video. So I'm going to try to be quick. But essentially, the premise of this video is, uh, and before I start, if you have not watched the podcast I did with D. Rosa and uh, Dorian Coleman over on D. Rosa's channel, uh, I'll link that up here or in the description or somewhere if I can figure out this YouTube thing. I'll link it somewhere, but I highly encourage you to check that out. Uh, three of us kind of chopped it up for about an hour or so about our approach to photography in general, street photography, uh, documenting uh, and recording family memories, and so on and so forth. You're gonna start an OnlyFans uh, for people who want to have a knee kink. Oh, only knees, <laughs> only knees, baby. <laughs> and basically, I was watching that video, and at the end of it, I had to go grab uh, my X Pro One, which I'll show you here a little modified version of the X Pro One that is currently a work in progress. So. Please don't judge it by its current appearance. But I, I was singing the praises of this camera at the end of that video, and I thought it was um, an opportune time to kind of uh, expound upon some of the things that I was talking about at the end of that video here on my channel. So uh, my this is not an initial impressions, I would say. This is a, because I've, I've had this camera. I actually bought this camera brand new uh, back in 2012 when it first released as Fujifilm's first X-Trans um, XF mount camera ever and uh loved it and kind of cut my teeth and learned photography on this camera but i recently repurchased it again just so i could um get back to like i guess the essence for as corny as that sounds the basis of photography seeing as this is what i learned on i kind of wanted to get my hands on one before they were too hard to find uh and in that time that i've been using it i've really really enjoyed coming back to this camera um both for i think nostalgic reasons and also just because it's even better than i remember it being and maybe it's because of the experiences I've had since then really made me come back and appreciate how good this really was back then. Cause I really don't, I, I don't, I don't think I've realized how good this camera was. So with that being said, I'm just going to run down a quick list of, like I said, I got 15, 20 minutes. I want to run down a quick list of the things I like uh, or I love about this camera really. And then also some of the things that are um, were surprising, uh, but like middle of the road, uh, maybe a, Pro maybe a con for you depends on your situation, and then a couple of things I don't like, uh, which I kind of really struggle with with this camera, and that's because I'm looking through it uh, through it with the lens of I know exactly what you're getting. It's a ten year old camera. It's not going to have the bells and whistles and eye autofocus and all these things that you probably don't really need to make a good photo. It won't have those things, but it has um, what what you need where it counts. What the hell does that mean? You get what I'm trying to say, I think. But let's get into it. So number one, um, I really, and this is what I, I kind of touched upon in the video with, with, with D and Dorian, is I can't understate how good, in my opinion, right? All this is my opinion. Please don't come for me in the comments. I don't have time to argue with you. Argue with yourself. Uh, but in my opinion, this camera has amazing colors, right? Particularly the JPEGs, but of course the raw files too. But the JPEGs out of this camera were definitely something special back in 2012. And it holds up in my opinion, today still. Uh, in some ways, it's kind of unmatched. Like, in you know, granted, this has a limited set of recipes that the other cameras that have come out since then, um, you know, have kind of one-upped and, and, and added to. However, there's something special about the original Astia, for instance, the original, um, what's it called? Uh, gosh, uh, negative standard and all the other... Uh, color profiles, the monochrome pro profiles, there's something special about how they rendered these out on the original X-Trans sensor that they've kind of tweaked and messed with since then. And I really don't think it has the same exact feel. Now, is this something you're going to notice in isolation? Probably not so much, but when you get them side by side, which I've, I've shot this side by side with the Fujifilm um, X100F, you know, so a, a, a couple generations newer on the sensor there. And you definitely notice it, I think. Um, so uh, just I cannot understate, I think, how amazing I found the, the colors of the JPEGs coming out of this camera. And for those who are curious, I will, I guess, run down real quick what settings I'm using as my frame of reference. And I don't have any photos up here now, but let's look at my Q menu. So I'm using I'm shooting this with uh, Astia. So I'm shooting Astia and uh, plus one on the sharpening, minus one on the color, minus one on the shadow tones, and minus one on the highlights. 
and it looks like I have noise reduction on negative two, and I believe I probably have a white balance shift too. Let's quickly check that. Um, white balance auto. No, no, no white balance shift. I think I did at one point, but I, I guess I don't anymore. But just those settings for me have been giving me really pleasing JPEGs right out of camera, uh, where even if I get the RAWs into my photo um, editing software choice afterwards, I'm not really able to match uh, the aesthetic of what I get straight up with the JPEG. So number one, amazing, amazing, amazing colors. Uh, number two, I wrote down here, uh, great user experience. Uh, now, what do I mean by that? Once again, this camera does not have all of the bells and whistles that uh, the um, successors to it do. However, uh, there's a couple things that you'd be surprised about. So when I say a great user experience, one thing I'm talking about is I really, really enjoy still to this day the handling of this camera. You know, at the time when this came out, there were not a lot of um, rangefinder styled uh, um, mirrorless bodies on the market. And so, and this was, of course, the only interchangeable lens one that had an OVF. Uh, and I won't touch on the OVF because that's actually my next point, uh, you know, not to spoil my next point, but OVF is a thing in, on its own for me personally. But uh, just the experience of using this camera, right? The, the tactility of the dials and the aperture ring on most of the lenses, and you got the exposure comp dial here. Um, it's all there, right? The things that we know and love. If you are, uh, if you got into Fujifilm for those things, not everyone did, but if you got into Fujifilm for those, it's all here and it's almost original iteration, right? It's kind of carried over from the original X100, but it's all here and it really makes for a good shooting experience for me personally, still, right? Reminiscent of other rangefinder cameras of, of years past and also just uh, film photography, I think in general with the manual feel, even when you're not shooting it in a manual mode. Like I really just love that experience and it makes you more involved in the photographic process. That may or may not mean a lot to you, but for me, it does uh, make taking photos more fun in, in a sense. And there's nothing wrong with having fun. Uh, you know, sometimes I have to take a break from these uh, kind of uh, stoic and just utilitarian Sony bodies where, you know, everything's kind of done for you. It's the easy mode, high autofocus, zone tracking continuous is just amazing sometimes i want to be a little bit more involved in the image uh and so that's why i kind of switch and bounce between two systems when it comes to uh um depending on you know the the, the use case and the scenario I, want, I find myself in uh but in general i would say that i just there's something just really enjoyable about how that all comes together for me uh probably spent too much time on that but let's move on to the next one uh so next point like i alluded to earlier the ovf for me, the OVF is really what makes the X Pro One the X Pro One. Um, if you're not a big OVF shooter, then hopefully the body size or something else about this uh, draws or calls your name. Um, because otherwise, you could just get an XE1, XE2, XE3, so on and so forth, and not bother with it at all. Uh, but for me, that OVF um, is just, once again, it adds to the feel and the experience of using this camera, and it just makes it fun. That's just how I get down. I understand the people who, who love the XE1s and, and XT1, XTs and so on and so forth. Um, happy for you. And nothing wrong with those cameras. Great, fantastic, amazing cameras. But every time I've had one of those, I've always missed the OVF and uh, the other Fuji bodies. So for me, the OVF is great. And like like just to give you points as to why I think it's so great, not only is it fun, but I really love just the experience of shooting with the frame lines. And having an idea of what's coming into the frame it's not super huge to me i don't want to overstate that however what i will say is that cutting my teeth on prior to this camera you know uh, a, a canon a t3 and other and, and viewing things through slrs before like I, in high school i've shot with a few film slrs but i didn't own any um but there was definitely something about seeing the real world through the viewfinder capturing that image and then when you actually see the image back it being a little bit different than what you saw through the OVF. You saw the real world, you took it, and either through the film stock on the film that you recorded it on or uh, through the digital file you have here, there's just something that, that, that speaks to me about how you shoot with the OVF of any kind and you kind of get what you get back as like a surprise versus when you're using the EVF and you kind of know exactly what the shot's going to be before you even hit the shutter button. There is no surprise. 
Um, that has its place when I need to be precise and I need to get the shot at, at any cost. The EVF to me is superior. But when I want to have fun and I want to do the photography for my own enjoyment, I'm going to stick with the OVF. That's my favorite. Uh, not to belabor that point too much. Let's move on to the third uh, or the fourth point I want to make. So the fourth point that what makes the Fuji film X Pro One great, especially in 2022, uh, is the price for now. Uh, as most of you know, this is the 10th, uh, 10 year anniversary of this camera. And I think that maybe through videos like this, or maybe through other means, people are starting to realize how special this was. And not only that, but digital cameras, you know, as they age, they get harder to repair and they just get scarcer on the market. And so, um, this may worsen over time, but right now there's still some deals to be had on the X Pro one body use, uh, obviously. Um, it's going to be, you're going to be hard pressed to find something new. And if you are, it's, you, they're going to charge an arm and a leg, but for used bodies anywhere from, I've seen like 250, uh, especially in previous years, but 250 or, or so up, up to like 500 is the range. I think you're working with for X pro ones. This one in particular, uh, cost me $300 and for what you're getting here, all the things I'm describing to you, I think that's an absolute steal, a great mirrorless camera with amazing colors and output. Um, and this shooting experience for $300, I think, is a really hard deal to beat. Uh, and I don't know of any other cameras in the market that gives you all of those things, if those things matter to you, the same way they do to me. So moving on from the price, let's talk about the, um, the body, I guess, itself. The fact that this is lightweight and compact. If you spent any time with me on this channel, you know how much I value a light and compact uh, body. And that's because I'm the type of person that, Whenever I leave the house, I typically like to have a camera on me in some form or fashion. It's not my, my smartphone. So even if I don't have any hands or any capacity for you to carry anything, I will put a, a Ricoh GR3 in my pocket. I'm that type of guy. So the smaller, the lighter or whatever a camera can be, the more carryable it is, it's going to be a plus for me. And this one is very lightweight and very um, uh, portable, I guess, especially when you pair it with the correct lens. Uh, in this case, I have a 35 millimeter F2 Fuji Cron lens. Maybe I'll review this one day if you're interested. But in any case, light, compact, that's a big plus on my list. Um, moving on to the next point. So the next point is going to be um, the things that are, for me, positives. Uh, but for some people, depending on your needs and use case, that could be a negative. So it's kind of mid, right? So, um, but for me, they were surprising. So the the first thing, resolution. Um, why would I say resolution? Uh, this is a 16 megapixel camera. That's not super high, right? When I say resolution, in this case, I don't mean uh, the the number on the spec sheet. I'm talking about the resolving power, uh, more specifically, of the sensor and lens combinations. So the whole re Fujifilm's whole reasoning or their explanation as to why they went with the X-Trans layout over the Bayer layout was so that they could remove the anti-aliasing filter in front of the sensor and get sharper output without introducing more way, more, more ray, more ray. Basically what that means is that, uh, especially paired with the right lens and, you know, shooting discipline, right? Don't, you know, be shooting everything wide open at whatever, right? Depending on the lens, uh, you can get some really, really, really sharp results. Even though it's a 16 megapixel sensor, it punches well above its weight in that regard. So that to me is a huge plus. 60 megapixels is still more than enough for most people's use case these days. That's more than enough to print uh, a lot of your common sizes, especially when the prints are viewed at a normal viewing distance. And it's absolutely more than enough for social media. So 16 megapixels is fine. It's more than good enough these days. And these are good, solid 16 megapixels you have here. Uh, so the next point I would say that could be good or could be bad for you, depending on your use case, is the autofocus speed. So why do I say that? How is that in the middle? Well, what I will say as someone who used this camera from release, when it first came out, the autofocus speed for this was, um, even for the time, I would say pretty disappointing, uh, to be frank with you. It was slow, uh, in, 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 especially in low light, but in any good, even in good lighting, it wasn't really the best. Um, it wasn't class leading, it was barely competitive uh, at the time, but, you know, what Fuji became known for at the time was their Kaizen firmware updates where they would constantly put out improvements and make things faster and faster. With that, it got better. It definitely got faster. 
one thing that gives this camera, in my opinion, a new lease on life is the fact that these newer lenses, right, this Fujicron, this 35 F2, is also touted as being a faster focusing lens. So coupling the lens with the firmware updates, I've actually been really surprised with how quickly this focuses. Now, I only use single point autofocus right in the center. I focus and recompose. Like I said, I use OVF on this camera. So that, that's how I like to do things. I don't move the focus point around or anything. And for that reason, it seems to perform pretty well for me, both in, in good light and it's not too bad in low light either with this, with this combination here. So uh, take that for what you will. It's more than good enough for me. Single point, middle, shoot, recompose. Even for, for a 10-year-old camera, I mean, that's what we were all doing back then pretty much anyways. So those are the two points that are kind of middle of the road that may or may not be good for you. It depends on your use case. Moving on to the, uh, the negatives of this camera. And here's where I kind of struggle because, once again, I'm a more realistic person. And I'm looking at this camera through the lens that this is a 10-year-old camera, right? And I'm also looking at my particular use case for this camera. So I'm not setting unrealistic expectations on it. And for that reason, I found it kind of hard to come up with a con list. Uh, in this case, one I did put up there was customizable buttons. Uh, this was so early in the Fuji lifespan that they didn't really have, they were really known for putting a lot of customization, uh, at least when it comes to their physical button layout in here. So on the top, you've got one FN you know, function button. And then you've got one D-pad button that you can customize. So you really only have two custom uh, buttons on this whole camera. And even what you can assign to them is, is, is fairly limited. Which leads me to my the, the last negative for me is that it has no physical ISO control, right? So this was before Fuji started integrating the ISO um, dial into the shutter speed dial. I know a lot of people don't like that. And I'm not. it's not my favorite form of um, adjusting ISO either. But I, I like that more than I like going into the menu sometimes, particularly because on the Fuji cameras, you can, if you don't like doing it physically, you can just set it and then put it on one of the dials and do it anyway. So I kind of wish that choice lived on this camera. It's not the end of the world. It's just something that I personally like because in, in a digital camera, at least, I love quick access to all components of the exposure triangle. So we've got the aperture, we've got our shutter speed on the top. It would be nice if I could also do the ISO so I can dial these settings in before I even bring the camera up to my eye, before I even turn it on even. Uh, and that's kind of the allure of Fuji to me is, is it gives me that experience of an analog device. But alas, ISO is not one of those things you can adjust uh, without looking at something here. But it's fine. Assign it to one of those two custom buttons and then adjust it to your heart's content. Not a deal breaker, but it kind of is what it is. Um, the other downside that I will say uh, when it comes to the layout of this is one thing I wish it had that I touched on in that podcast, go watch that if you haven't, um, is that the OVF does not have the sub LCD in it like the X-Pro2 and the um, later X100 uh, series bodies do. Uh, for most people, that's not a big deal. A lot of people don't like using that, particularly if you have an autofocus lens, which I do have on this. But the only reason I even bought this autofocus lens is because it doesn't have that sub LCD. If it did have that sub LCD, I would have a manual focus uh, in mount lens on this camera and I would be manually focusing everything through the OVF, getting focus peaking within that sub LCD. But because I don't have that, uh, it became useful for nothing but framing, which I, I, I don't like because I don't always like the zone focus and I'm not always in situations where I, I'm allotted the luxury of zone focusing depending on the light, lighting. So for that reason, um, I had to go ahead and pick up a, a autofocus lens because I really wanted to continue using the OVF. I don't like using EVFs on a camera of this style for real. Uh, but in any case, that is one more negative that I, I, I thought is worth mentioning uh, depending on how you plan on shooting this camera, if you were gonna pick it up, right? Overall, what I recommend it in 2022, Absolutely, I would for the reasons I said there, but really just use my experiences, compare them to your own use cases and experiences and make make up your own mind, make a decision for yourself. I can't make that decision for you, but I'm assuming that if you clicked on this video, you're wanting to get an idea of what it is like using this camera and the things, uh, you know, things of that nature. And so I thought it would be prudent to give you a short list of the things I like, the things that are decent for me but maybe a downside for you and the things that i don't like once again this is my personal list if you want to argue with me put in the comments i won't respond you can argue back and forth with yourself 
besides that, you know, have a good one. And hopefully I see you in the next one, man. Go watch that podcast. Appreciate you. I'm out. Peace.